Back in 39, New Zealand was a peaceful, prosperous country. In a quiet sort of way, we wanted to make our country a still better place to live in. That was our ambition. We had little understanding of fascism and bullying dictators. When Britain was at war, we were at war. For we were bound by the triple ties of race, sentiment and trade. We mobilized our forces. They were small, for we hadn't wanted a war. It was an unhappy way for New Zealand to celebrate 100 years as a nation. Four months after war was declared, first echelon volunteers marched through Wellington. This was still the phony war. We didn't know what horrors lay before us, but we did know that in a European war, New Zealand's ramparts lay close to Europe. For the second time in 26 years, New Zealand lads trained on the Egyptian sands. To men so far away, mail from home could not come often enough. And the men had something to write home about. Such scenes were strange to New Zealand eyes. Back to Auckland came the Achilles after the Graf's Bay sinking. What the New Zealand cruiser had done in that early action was a foretaste of how New Zealand sailors fought all through the war. The soldiers who came back from Crete had made history too. By their stubborn retreat through Greece and their heroic defense of Crete, They'd helped delay the German attack on the Soviet Union. By their courage and their tenacity in the face of overwhelming odds, they'd shown that they were some of the world's finest soldiers. From the Wellington wharves, reinforcements sailed to fill the ranks of the depleted division. Boatload followed boatload, and there were many gaps in New Zealand homes. And then Japan struck in Malaya, took Singapore. For defense, we had the home guard. All the men and all the weapons we had came into service. They included jammed in bombs. Air raid rehearsals became part of our lives. We never knew when an attack might come. There was intensive training for every man who could carry a rifle. This was total war and we were a country in arms. Where men left to fight, women carried on. They shared the burden as never before. In the time of total mobilization, they helped to keep the country going. The war had come so close to New Zealand that it had now become an advanced base for the United States forces. But New Zealand air trainees still went to Canada to train for the RAF. In spite of our own problems, we still played our part in the Empire Air Training Scheme. Since the very start of the war, New Zealanders had fought in the RAF. They fought in the Battle of Britain, and now they were in the front ranks for the bombing of Germany. For those who were lost, others came to take their place. In the air war, the New Zealanders were always there. In the desert, the Kiwis were getting ready to fight again. They'd come down from Syria when Rommel knocked on the gates of Egypt. Now it was October 23rd, 1942, and this was Alamein. Now the Germans were on the run and the 8th Army was on their heels. So began one of the greatest chases in military history, a chase that only slowed up in Tripoli, 1,500 miles away. In that fast-moving 8th Army, the New Zealand Division was the fastest of them all. Never again did we know what it was to retreat. The end came in Tunisia in May 43, when the Germans burnt their tanks and Germans filled the prison cages. Back in Egypt, there was a well-earned rest.
Then, after three and a half years, the first echelon came home on leave. Not all came back. Some were prisoners of war. Others would never return. In the meantime, American troops had held the Japanese on an island called Guadalcanal. The shadow of Japanese invasion had been lifted. From Panuapai, bombers of the RNZAF took off for the Pacific. New Zealand was taking her part in the Pacific War. Rested and re-equipped, the New Zealand division crossed over to Italy. There, it was hoped, would be the soft underbelly of the Axis. So began the long struggle up through Italy. Yes, Italy was very different from the desert. And New Zealand's 3rd Division had moved into the Pacific. They trained in Guadalcanal before they took Treasury, Vera la Vera and Nissan. Fortunately, the 3rd Division encountered little resistance and casualties were light, but problems of organization were enormous. Maintaining two divisions overseas was a proud achievement for a country the size of New Zealand. In the United Nations, she pulled her weight. And as Mr. Churchill said, New Zealand had never made a false step. Slowly, the second division moved up Italy, switching from one coast to another, always fighting where the going was toughest. This was their welcome in Florence. Back home, New Zealand had added large-scale vegetable growing to her wartime undertakings. With fresh and dried vegetables, she was helping to feed American forces in the Pacific. In April 45, world interest was centered in San Francisco, and the Prime Minister spoke for New Zealand. I cannot single out the achievements of the United Kingdom, but just point this out. Uh, that after Dunkirk, Britain alone, with her daughters around her, her daughter nations around her, held the pass for mankind. For over five and a half years, we'd been waiting for this day. The war wasn't over, but one set of dictators had been crushed. The world was a little safer for free men and women. There was still Japan, and to New Zealand waters came HMS Howe, on her way to the Pacific. The RNZAF was still operating in the Pacific, keeping up the blockade on islands of bypassed Japs. But we hadn't time to redispose our forces when the end came. The war was well and truly over. We had won the war, now we had to win the peace. Housing was one of our problems. Building camps, aerodromes, stores, magazines, roadblocks and gun emplacements had put a check to our pre-war plans for houses. Now we had a colossal task ahead of us. Training returned men for the building trade is solving two problems at once, housing and rehabilitation. If it's a farmer an old soldier wants to be, here's his chance. New Zealand's rehabilitation scheme is the world's most generous. There are the world's post-war problems. A starving world looks to us for more meat and more butter. Now our factories can make household utensils instead of grenades, mortar bombs and brand carriers. Plans have to be made for the future. For it's to the future that we look. We want a world with a security for the young and the old, where there's freedom from want and freedom from fear. It was our desire for these things that made the war worth fighting. Now we have to work to get them.